you, Sister Logan. <clears throat> this is the seventh message <clears throat> in uh, our study of the Holy City, New Jerusalem, which is the last two chapters of the book of the Revelation. The vision that John saw, the final, the final thing that the Lord showed him, <clears throat> which is the final thing that uh, God is doing in His present work. It's going to be His rest and ours. So we're very interested in this, what John saw. <clears throat> so I want to get right into this. <clears throat> Verse 9 says, There came unto me one of the seven angels, which had one of the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me. Now I considered this, <clears throat> that we, we know that the angels are innumerable. There are many angels, so there's, it's not like there's a shortage of angels in heaven. And yet, this angel is kind of doing double duty. Not only is he one of the angels that poured out the seven vials of wrath upon the earth, but now this same angel is going to show John a closer look at the heavenly city, the holy city. Now, one would think that there's so many angels that another angel could have done this, could have shown this to John. But... Uh, this particular angel apparently is one of the more prominent angels. That's why the Lord is using him for both of these things, both pouring out vials of wrath and, and showing this vision to John. We could say he was one of the seven that poured out those seven vials of the seven last plagues on the earth. <clears throat> Yet he was also selected to show John this vision. Now this is God's manner. For example, if, if the Lord had 100 servants, I can just about guarantee you he, he's not going to give 1% of the work to each servant. That's just not the way the Lord works. Yes. We, we know from Scripture he, doesn't, he, he just doesn't do it that way. That's what, that's, that way you know it's of God. He might give one servant 40% of the ministry and divide the rest through the other 99. Now that's the Lord's manner, but now that's just... Uh, a speculation, of course. <clears throat> Jesus had many disciples, more than 12, but there were only 12 that were with him all the time. And you know, of those 12, there were three who were even closer than the others. They were, they were with him when, at certain times when the other nine were not. And then of those three, there was one that was even closer yet, referred to as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Which one, by the way, is the one who received this vision? <clears throat> so not everyone gets the same thing. <clears throat> now what this is an indication of, that, that this one angel would pour out one of the seven last plagues, and the same angel would show this vision to John, tells us the importance of this vision. Mm -hmm. That a prominent angel has been given this ministry. <clears throat> It's an indication of the importance and grand nature of this vision. Not just any angel showed this to John. Not as though there is such a thing as a common run-of-the-mill angel. <clears throat> of the angels, he saith, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. <clears throat> but this was a special angel because this is a special vision. And this particular angel did not show this vision to just any believer. He showed it to John, the beloved apostle, who was in the isle that is called Patmos, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ, and I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Now if men can be versatile, then how much more this, the holy angels? <clears throat> Remember those seven vials of wrath contained God's wrath. The holy angels can minister vials of wrath of God, and they can show the bride, the Lamb's wife. This particular angel specialized in the last things, pouring out plagues of wrath in the final days of the earth, but he also specialized in new things, showing John the, the new Jerusalem with such glory and power and might to pour out a plague upon the whole earth, yet so tender as to show the tender-hearted and beloved John, the Lamb's bride. Now all the saints are like this. This is actually a godlike quality that I'm talking about here. The saints are like this, mighty and tender, valiant warriors and also the best of peacemakers. One day we may be, we may be running toward the giant of Gath with sling in hand and the next day tending sheep. 
or playing skillfully upon the harp to soothe the soul. Whatever is required. See, the saints can do this. <clears throat> so this, this is the angel that came and talked with John, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. <clears throat> now, the angel doesn't grab John by the scruff of the neck and drag him along, but he asks him, he says, Come here. He's asking him to yield, yield to me. I want to show you something. <clears throat> Yield to me and I'll show you something wonderful. Well, when he says, I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife, what believer would not willingly yield to this angel and see what the vision is? So verse 10, he carried me away in the spirit. John is asked to come hither, and yet he had to be carried away in the spirit. John did what he could by submitting to the angel, and the angel carried him to the right place to receive this vision from the Lord. He was carried away in the spirit, which means that his body probably was not involved. John's body was left on Patmos while he was carried away. I would not doubt that if we were to see his body, he probably appeared as though he were dead. The mortal body cannot handle the things that John saw, and the things that John saw have no benefit for the body. Therefore, he was carried away in the spirit. That is, John's spirit was carried away to another place. Only the part of John's constitution that could receive the heavenly vision was carried away. That's the willing part. The circumcised part. Amen. The part that serves in newness. The part that the Holy, him, Holy Spirit himself bears witness to. That's the part that is one with the Lord. The part that's going to be saved. The part that can see and reason upon heavenly things. So all of John's cognitive capacities were carried away from his body and away from the earth to see this vision. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain. <clears throat> First, let's take note that <clears throat> when the Lord carries us away in the spirit, it will always be up. The angel didn't take John down to the earth for a closer look at the plagues. <clears throat> he didn't carry him in the spirit down to a deep valley, but up to a great and high mountain. So that's a good rule of thumb for the saints to remember. Body down, spirit up. <clears throat> if the body is sick, now we want it to be in good health. We have, a, we have a dear sister in the hospital this evening. But we want our bodies to be in good health so that we can serve the Lord. We don't, don't want to be hindered by the body. <clears throat> we don't want to pamper it, but we do want it to be able to serve the Lord without hindrance. <clears throat> Amen. John was carried away to a great and high mountain. That's it. It's thick, very broad and high. <clears throat> the mountain was great in that it covered a lot of area. The mountain, this mountain doesn't have sharp, jagged peaks jutting up into the sky, but it's very great. It's very broad. <clears throat> like a plain is very, very broad, but this isn't a plain, it's a mountain. <clears throat> this mountain, like every other mountain, was created for a special purpose. It was made for a great city, which means this mountain is inhabitable. <clears throat> And the mountain is very high. It's above everything else. <clears throat> to see it, you have to look up and be carried up. It's great and high because it is the main object of God's present work. It's the finished product of the Lamb's shed blood and His heavenly rule. This mountain is host to the city that will not be hidden, the holy city, the new Jerusalem, We'll read later on that the holy city that sits on this great and high mountain will reside, in this city will reside the very throne of God and the Lamb. And those who dwell there will see His face. That's how high this mountain is. <clears throat> From this mountain, every other place is down. And John says, And He showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. <clears throat> Now this mountain has to be great because this city is great. The scene here is that the holy Jerusalem is going to cover the entire mountain. It's going to descend out of heaven from God and come to dwell on that great and high mountain. Now John got to see in this vision <clears throat> before it actually takes place and he's going to tell us what he saw. We also can't help but remember that John also saw the city coming down in verse 2 earlier in this chapter. 
And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Now, according to John's own record here, he actually saw this twice. In verse 2, and then here in verse 10. And I, I do not believe that he only saw it once and recorded it twice. I believe he actually saw it twice. Each in different settings. <clears throat> In these last two chapters of the book of the Revelation, there is an order. There's like a progression that we're going to see here <clears throat> in what is being revealed. We're going to start with an introduction, then inside, then view the outside, and progress to the inside. So in ch chapter 21, verses 1 and 2, John sees just like an outline or a summary of, a, of what he's going to see in great detail later. <clears throat> He sees that the old heaven and the old earth have passed away, and there's a new heavens and a new earth, and he sees the holy city descending down. That's just kind of a summary of, of what's coming up ahead. That's just the first two verses. <clears throat> then in verses 3 through 8, John hears a voice from heaven, heaven making an announcement concerning the vision. So, And from this voice, we know where this vision is coming from. <clears throat> Who caused the new heaven and the new earth to spring forth? To whom should we give glory for the new, new Jerusalem? Yeah. All things are of God. Yeah. So in these verses, 3 through 8, God declares the holy city, and he declares that he will be there, and what he will do there for his people. And he tells John to write these things down, and he gives promises to those who hear these things and believe it. <clears throat> and these promises that he gives are with this holy city in mind. So now... This is given in such an order that by the time we get to verse 9, we already know what this is about. <clears throat> we know that we are being given a vision of the culmination of the work of Christ. <clears throat> we know that this is the city we've been seeking. Amen. This is the temple that Jesus is building. This is the bride, the Lamb's wife. This is the city where God and the Lamb will be. Yeah. But we haven't gotten the details yet. So then, in our text for this evening, beginning at verse 9, the angel begins to show John more of the detail, but what we're going to see through verse 21 is just an exterior of the holy city. And we're only going to verse 14 tonight, but on through verse 21, there's just an exterior view, the outside view of the city. <clears throat> and then later on, we're going to get inside the city, and, and John will tell us what's in the city. <clears throat> so then in verse... Uh, 10, John again sees a city descending out of heaven from God. <clears throat> and I, although the text doesn't actually say it, I think it's safe and wise to presume that the city is descending down to the mountain that's great and high, the mountain that John is standing upon. <clears throat> Otherwise, if, if it weren't, then where would it be descending to? <clears throat> and what other reason could there be for such a great and high mountain if it were not to be host to this great city? So the angel carried John away in the spirit to this mountain for him to observe the city coming to rest there and to report what he saw about it. And now from uh, verse 11 through 21, John's going to be given to see the new Jerusalem as one would approach the city. And his first impression in verse 11, having the glory of God. Mm, yeah. And her light was like a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Does the holy city have some glory, or is it just kind of glorious? No, it has the glory of God. Amen. Not just a limited representation of His glory, like the present heavens and the earth, or like when God's feet touch Sinai. No, but all of His glory, having the glory of God. Yes, that is that is the reason for the holy city. Yeah. It's for Him to dwell in. Amen. <clears throat> it's the city where God can let His glory shine in all its brilliance. The city is the temple that the sun is building for the habitation of God. Mm -hmm. It is His rest, mm -hmm. that is, as it is recorded in Scripture, in the 132nd Psalm, For the Lord hath chosen Zion, he hath desired it for his habitation. Yes. This is my rest forever. Amen. Here will I dwell, for I have desired it. Mm 
And Psalm 68, the hill of God is as the hill of Bashan, and high hill as the hill of Bashan. Why leap ye, ye high hills, Everest, K2, Mount McKinley, Kilimanjaro, why are you leaping up for attention? This is the hill which God desireth to dwell in. Yea, the Lord will dwell in it forever. And the 102nd Psalm, when the Lord shall build up Zion, he shall appear in his glory. I love that. I know I read it often. <clears throat> The holy city has the glory of God. It is not like the glory of God, nor does it merely give glory to God, although it does, but it has the glory of God. John saw it descending from God and having the glory of God. <clears throat> That's because the throne of God is in it. It is his habitation forever. Now, do you want to know why every son of God receives chastening? <clears throat> It's because the holy city has the glory of God. We are being prepared for God, and through Jesus Christ, He has prepared us, has prepared for us a kingdom. This is why we are members of the body of Christ, and why we are held together with joints that minister nourishment. This is the reason for edification. This is why we are being fitly framed together, and why we grow together. We are being built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. Amen. The holy Jerusalem has the glory of God. So this is, this is what we're heading towards. <clears throat> this is why some days it's kind of rough on us. Because we, we need it in preparation for this. Amen. John describes now the light emanating from the city. Amen. It's impossible to have the glory of God and not shine His light. <clears throat> Her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Now you know, gemstones don't produce light of themselves. Light doesn't, isn't produced in the stone. <clears throat> but they are brilliant reflectors of exi existing light. And later on in verse 23, John will tell us, The city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. So the new Jerusalem is God's chosen jewel. It's being formed and built up by Jesus to fully and precisely reflect the fullness of the glory of God. And this is what John saw. <clears throat> the brilliance of the holy city is like the most precious stone, the clearest stone, like crystal. There are no dark spots, no unreflective areas, no flaws. Through and through, everywhere in the holy city, God's glory shines unimpeded. And not only does it shine, but to borrow a term from the jewelry industry, it's dazzling. Yes. Now a mirror reflects light too, but not like a stone does. A properly cut stone of good quality actually will glorify the light. Every aspect of God's glory shines through the city so that it sparkles and glistens of God and of His Lamb. That is the light of the city that John saw. Now about the jasper stone, the jasper stone is mentioned several times in Scripture, <clears throat> and there doesn't seem to be a lot of agreement upon this stone. Some say it's red, some say it's yellow. Most acknowledge that there are several different colors of jasper stone. Some say green, some say blue. But from what John wrote here, it seems to be crystal clear to me what color the stone is. I said crystal clear. The light was being shown from the city like a crystal clear stone reflects light. Clarity is the point here, not cut or color. It was clear as crystal, faithfully glorifying God. Yeah. The great light of the city was the first thing that John noted when he saw it descend from God. But now he's going to get in a little closer. We're going to see some more detail outside the city, beginning at verse 12. <clears throat> John begins to describe its walls and gates. It had a wall great and high and had 12 gates. <clears throat> now cities with walls and gates are kind of a foreign concept in our culture in many parts of the world, but not very long ago walls and gates were very important for a city. The survival of a city depended on its walls. If no walls, 
you don't have a city then. That's just the way it was. The walls provided a defense that was either very difficult to overcome or ideally impossible to overcome. In a city with great walls, the people felt safe and therefore they thrived. Because of the walls, they were not hindered in their work or hindered in increasing. There was no fear of enemies to slow them down. If an enemy were to attack a walled cities, the walls would slow the enemy down and sap their strength, causing them to waste their resources trying to get through. So before they could get to the people inside the city, they had to deal with this wall. And the walls gave the people in the city a defense to hide behind and more time to do whatever was needed. In short, the strength of the city was equal to the walls around it. <clears throat> now this is certainly true of Zion. But there's even more to this than walls and gates of a city. A walled city meant that the city was established and that it was going to continue to be established. Amen. The walls said something about the people of the city. Now Nehemiah understood all of these things when he set himself to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 17, Then said I unto them, Ye see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lieth waste, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come and let us build up the wall of Jerusalem, that we be no more a reproach. Yes. Why was it a reproach that Jerusalem and her walls lie waste? <clears throat> It wasn't a, a reproach because the people needed places to live. That wasn't it. It was not a reproach because the city was defenseless. It was a reproach because it was the city of God. It's not right that the city that God has chosen have walls that are broken down and gates that are burned. It's not right that the place that bears His name lie waste. Psalm 59, 9, Because of his strength will I wait upon thee, for God is my defense. And Psalm 94, 22, But the Lord is my defense, and my God is the rock of my refuge. If God has strength and is our defense and our rock of refuge, then surely the city where he dwells has great walls and gates. That's why God raised up men like Nehemiah and Ezra and Zerubbabel and Joshua, <clears throat> the priest. It's to build in his city. Because the city shows his glory, it's like him. That's why the holy city has a great and a high wall, because our God is an impenetrable fortress, like a great and a high wall. God is the defender of his people. In him we are safe and established. <clears throat> if he is for us, no one can be against us. God is known in her palaces for a refuge. For lo, the kings were assembled. They passed by together. They saw it, and so they marveled. They were troubled and hasted away. Fear took hold on them there, as pain as of a woman in travail. Thou breakest the ships of Tarshish with an east wind. As we have heard, so have we seen in the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God. God will establish it forever. In this psalm, these kings who had assembled themselves together against the city were troubled and hasted it away in fear merely by the sight of it. They just passed by and got afraid and went back home. That's the kind of defense that God is for his people. No confrontation is necessary. <clears throat> And when John saw the holy city coming down, there were no enemies, and there's not going to be any enemies in the world to come, so you may wonder why these great walls. Well, because that's the way God is, and this is his habitation. And the walls aren't for our defense, we don't need a defense, but that's the way God is, and it's his city. <clears throat> the city does not have great and high walls to deter present enemies, but they stand as a testimony that the city exists because God cast down all his enemies and ours. <clears throat> Not only is the wall of the holy city very thick and very high, but John also saw that there were 12 gates. <clears throat> Verses 12 through 14. And at the gates, 12 angels and names written thereon, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel, on the east, three gates. On the north, three gates. On the south, three gates. And on the west, three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. <clears throat> 
We've spoken about uh, the nature of this great city before, that actually, technically the city is not built for the redeemed, but it is built of the redeemed. <clears throat> the holy city is not for God's people, but the holy city is God's people who are built up for God to inhabit. The truth is being affirmed in this passage. So with this in mind, it helps us understand better about gates and foundations with names on them. <clears throat> In John 10, Jesus said, I am the door. And we know and we believe that Jesus is the only way to the Father. But now we don't see a gate in the city with Jesus' name on it. <clears throat> That's because the city is the people that Jesus has redeemed with his own blood. And the city is the Lamb's wife. That's what we're seeing here. God has ordained that the borders of the holy city be established with the foundational persons that he has chosen. The city could have been designed with one single gate named after Abraham. <clears throat> but that's not, how God, that's not how God designed it. In a very true sense, everyone gets in through Father Abraham, both Jew and Gentile. Or there could have been three gates with the names of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob on them. But that's not the way God chose to do it. <clears throat> Actually, the design with the 12 gates is the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham <clears throat> and to Isaac and to Jacob. We know that Abraham will not be without great reward in the world to come, as well as Isaac and Jacob. But part of that reward is to have their offspring <clears throat> be at the entering into the holy city. Yeah. The righteousness and significance of this has yet to be seen in the earth because God's not finished yet. Mm -hmm. So right now, in, in, in time in which we're living, this doesn't seem reasonable to some men. And you can find this out when you read commentaries, like why 12 tribes of Israel, why, why have their names on these gates? You know, they're, they're, nine of them or ten of them are lost, right? Never to be found again. Well, that's not what God said. Yes, so when, when God's finished with his work, this is going to become more significant. <clears throat> and we'll see this more clearly why the gates have the 12 names of the 12 tribes of Israel. Yeah. By faith we see it now. Because we know what the Lord's going to do. <clears throat> <clears throat> when ungodliness is turned away from Jacob and their sins are forgiven, more light will be shed on the significance of the names of these 12 gates. But now we should also consider this from the Gentile point of view. We should remind ourselves how we got into this city. For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy, talking about the nation of Israel. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches were broken off, and thou, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches. Mm -hmm. But if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, the root bears you. <clears throat> if it were not for God's working through the chosen nation of Israel, there would be no Gentile believers. God has purposed for it to be this way. <clears throat> Romans 9 verse 4, Who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, whose are the fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came, who is over all. God blessed forever. Amen. Amen. The root of the tree is Jewish. It always was Jewish and always will be Jewish. Yeah. If you heard the gospel, it is because it began to be preached and spread throughout the world by Jesus' Jewish apostles. Every time God revealed his glory, it was to the Jews. Every covenant that God made with man was with the Jewish man. The only righteous law ever given was given by God to the Jews. Only Jews were chosen to serve God in his temple, the priests and the Levites. The holy prophets were all Jews. The promises of God were given to Israel. The fathers of this great people, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, are the fathers of the Jews. Furthermore, the Lord's Christ came from the Jews, Amen. which means that concerning his earthly heritage, the Savior of the world, the Lamb of God, the Lord's Christ, is a Jew. Amen. Amen. How did you get into the holy city, Gentile? Yeah. Through the sustenance provided by this root, yeah. the root of Israel. God in his great mercy grafted us into the Jewish olive tree. Yeah. 
The 12 gates to the holy city do not represent spiritual Israel or mystical Israel, whatever in the world that's supposed to mean. <clears throat> Nor are they representative of the church, of both Jew and Gentile, as some have said. The names on the twelve gates are just as the Holy Spirit has stated, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel, Amen. Jacob's twelve sons. Amen. Those are the names. <clears throat> Everything within the holy city is contained within the borders of what God did with the nation of Israel. That's why they're the walls. They're the outside. It's like everything else is held within what they, what God did through them. <clears throat> God formed from one man Abraham, formed this nation, raised them up in Egypt, and delivered them from bondage in Egypt. Only the seed of Abraham were promised the holy land. And ever since then, all the nations of the earth has watched have watched Israel as God has used them to demonstrate His faithfulness, His ability to do what He has promised, to see how He reacts when His people sin, to see how He must be served, to behold His love and mercies, to see how great a matter the putting away of sin is, particularly in the temple service. <clears throat> to see how he chastises his sons and how he will destroy whatever bears his name and becomes corrupted and how a mediator can stand in the gap for a people and how he can gather and recreate and save and much much more all this is demonstrated in Israel everything we know about God we know from the Jews God has used his chosen nation to reveal himself and his wisdom not only to mankind but to angels. It's right that the gates to the holy city bear the names of Jacob's offspring. Amen. God has developed and continues to develop what he is doing in the earth through them. Amen. Salvation is of the Jews. So Jesus said that. Now it may not, might not make a lot of sense to some people <clears throat> that the names on the gates of the city are the names of the twelve tribes of Israel, but God's not done working yet. <clears throat> the world will yet see God bring life from the dead yeah. through Israel. Yes. And remember now, the city is built to accommodate God. That's what the city's for. Yes. Not built to accommodate men yeah. or their doctrines or their beliefs. <clears throat> it is a display of who He is, not what man is. These are the things that God has chosen to work with. That's why there are 12 gates and the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. And above the 12 gates there are 12 holy angels. I don't doubt that these are specific angels. Probably by name we'll learn <clears throat> in the glory <clears throat> that these angels have been given a specific ministry, each one for each tribe, working in and preserving the 12 tribes to this very day. And in due time, we will see they have been faithful and that God has indeed given them wisdom and power to perform their ministry well. These are the 12 gates that are in the wall of the holy city. But there's more than just these things now. There's more to the bulwark of the city than just the wall and gates. The entire border, which includes the wall and gates, is supported by 12 foundations. Yes. Yeah. Verse 14 again. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The wall and the gates both rest on the foundation of the apostles. By contrast, not on Moses, not on the foundation of the church. <clears throat> God bless Moses, and I don't doubt that Moses has a very prominent place in the world to come because God made him prominent here. But the salvation of the twelve tribes, as well as every Gentile, is due to the preaching and writing of the apostles of the Lamb. Amen. The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ, and the apostles are the stewards of this gospel. Indeed, they support not only the twelve gates, but the entire wall of the city. Jesus chose these men, and they were faithful to their calling. The apostles were with Jesus from the beginning of his earthly ministry up to his death, and every one of them were witnesses of his resurrection. In the great day of judgment, I look forward to hearing the testimony of the holy apostles. How they heard and believed and witnessed and preached 
expounded what Jesus accomplished, gave signs and wonders, and traveled and suffered, how they counted all things lost for Christ, how they persevered in life, spending their last breath and devotion to the blessed gospel right. of Jesus Christ. Right. It is by their faithful report that we have heard the joyful yes. sound yes. and believed. And it is by their faithful report that Israel will yet be saved, yes. as God has said. They have been made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men. Yeah. Think of it. <clears throat> Think about this. Now, everything, everything that Jesus accomplished, including what he is presently doing, he committed to his 12 apostles to expound and report to the rest of the world. So as the holy city... The Lamb's wife begins to be unfolded here before John's eyes. This is what he sees on the outside. He sees these foundational persons that God has worked with. These are the ones that he has chosen and formed for his own habitation and for the bride for his Christ. And we're just on the outside so far. It's like if you were to get on the highway and drive toward a, a great city, Long before you get to the city, you can see the, the, what we call the skyline. You see the buildings rising up. And if you're familiar, you, you can recognize the city long before you get there. Right. Oh, there, that's Atlanta, Georgia. I recognize that. For me, there's Chicago. I, there's Sears Tower and the Hancock Building. Yeah. Used to be the two tallest buildings in the world. I, I know where I'm at now. Well, here John, he's just kind of seen the skyline, so to speak. He's, he's on the approach to the city, and already it's glorious. Yeah. So you can see how God, has, God is using men. Jesus is using men to build this city for God. <clears throat> From some distance here, John begins to see the identity of the glorious habitation of God and the bride of the Lamb. <clears throat> this is the city. <clears throat> this city is what God and Christ are doing with believing men. So I want to leave you with this word from the 87th Psalm. Glorious things are spoken of thee, O city of God. Selah. Yeah.